Hi, welcome to session six of History 3375, CIA and the Third World. Uh, today we're going to pick up on our continuing study of interventions by the CIA and the Third World and look at an intervention that was much closer to home than the last one where we intervened in Iran, uh, but followed it by only a year. 1954 is the year in which the United States, the CIA, intervened in Guatemala to topple the government there. And we're going to look first, as we did last time, at the historical background of this country uh, to understand what was the fundamental problem or what were the issues that were causing a crisis in this society, and then look at the actual intervention. Now, when we look at the historical part today, I'm primarily going to focus on Guatemala, but I'm also going to look at Central America in general, partly because Guatemala needs to be understood within the context of being a Central American country, and partly because we're going to revisit Guatemala later in the course when we look at the U.S. intervention in another Central American country in Nicaragua in the 1980s. So it will serve both of those purposes to look at both Guatemala specifically, but also more generally to make some mention of Central America as a whole and how its problems contribute to the issues that arose in Guatemala, certainly by the middle of the 20th century. If we go to the first slide here, I start off by talking about the inescapable past of Guatemala. What I mean by that is that the colonial past of Guatemala, as well as historical forces that shaped its history in the 19th and early 20th century, had a powerful effect on what would happen to Guatemala in the middle of the 20th century. Many of the problems and difficulties that rack this country in the modern era have a long history that stretch into its historical past. Now, we're going to look at this first in the larger context of Central American history because there are several things that we can talk about here that, while they specifically apply to Guatemala, also apply more generally to Central America as a whole. The most important of these is what's called the Spanish colonial legacy, as I point out here. Certain factors, relationships, institutions that affected the development of Central America, but also more specifically Guatemala. The first is the power of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was a close partner of the Spanish crown in its ruling of the Western Hemisphere. The Church provided, if you will, the ideological underpinning for Spain's control of much of the Western Hemisphere from the time of Columbus all the way down to the wars for independence when most Latin American countries broke away from Spain at the beginning of the 19th century. The Catholic Church essentially provided a justification for Spain's rule over millions of indigenous inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere, providing a justification that the Spanish king or queen ruled in the name of God himself, and therefore the subjects of the Spanish crown must accept its rule as God's emissary on earth. And this gave a powerful force for stability within Latin American and more specifically Central American countries as people accepted Spanish rule, at least on the surface, as a divinely ordained reality. So the church would remain down through the centuries and into the 19th and 20th centuries an important underpinning for the control, the political control of these societies. It provided a justification for rule first by Spain and then by local elites, and it would also be an ardent opponent of those who threatened revolutionary change within these societies. And we will see, of course, the church is going to play a role in the events that we discuss in the 1950s. The second factor that I point out here as part of that legacy uh, is the issue of Indian labor. Most of Central America was populated by indigenous inhabitants, many of them the descendants of the Mayan Empire, which had declined before the arrival of the Spanish. These inhabitants provided the labor force through which the Spanish exploited the natural resources of Central America and indeed the entire Western Hemisphere. And the mechanisms used to exploit that labor usually involve some type of oppressive labor relationship. And by that I mean, for example, Indians were required to pay tribute, or we would call a tax today. And often that tax had to be paid in the form of labor. So this was one way of requiring the indigenous inhabitants to work. 
At other times, Indians were essentially assigned to individual Spanish, Spanish colonists, and the Spanish colonists had control over these individuals and could force them to work for him. So forced labor became a fundamental part of the social relationships of Central American societies all the way back in the colonial era. That led to societies in which there was enormous social and economic inequality, where the vast majority of the population, 90% of it, consisted of indigenous inhabitants who were oppressed by the controlling European society and whose labor was exploited for the benefit of that minority. And this was a reality that, again, persisted into the 19th and 20th centuries and lies at the heart of much of the instability within Central America down through the 19th and 20th centuries. Finally, there is the place that the Central American colonies held within Spain's empire. In terms of their economies, they provided export products, what were called dye stuffs. Uh, this could be uh, berries, it may be the bark off trees, uh, which is used to make dye, to dye clothes, textiles, etc. Also cattle hides, things of this sort. But primary products, like dye stuffs and cattle hides, were exported to Spain in return for finished goods like glass, hardware, finished wooden products. This was the basic exchange relationship that was established during uh, the imperial period uh, with Central America, and always with Central America at a disadvantage in the sense that because of Spain's monopoly, these colonial areas had to sell their products at the lowest price possible and were charged high prices for the goods that they bought from Spain. That kind of dependence on certain primary products and these unequal trade relationships were, again, characteristics of these societies and their economies that will persist all the way into the modern era. Now, these relationships would largely remain unaffected by the political change that came in the first quarter of the 19th century. If we go back to the slide for a second, that change is independence. The Central American colonies initially emerged in the early 1820s as a part of Mexico. They were provinces of Mexico. So they emerged with Mexico when Mexico first achieved its independence at that time. But very soon they broke away to form their own confederation, the Confederation of the Central American States. They tried to form essentially a federalized state in which the various provinces, like Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, Costa Rica, formed constituent parts of this larger confederation, this larger federal state. However, that reality was not going to last for long. By the 1840s, the relationship, the confederation, had begun to break down as various groups in the different areas warred against each other, and the confederation soon collapsed uh, to form eventually the five Central American states that we're now familiar with. And this was certainly true by the end of the 1840s. Now, the end of the Confederation didn't mean the end of problems for Central America. Economic problems haunted the region from the time of independence. Although their relationship with Spain had been an unequal one in terms of the exchange of goods, nevertheless, it did give Central American economies a guaranteed market where they could sell their goods. With independence, they are now thrown upon the world market to compete with other sources of these products. And, for example, dye stuffs run into problems because industrial nations are starting to produce dye stuffs synthetically, making them in factories. And the Central American economies will suffer severe problems in these years, certainly through the mid-19th century, because of their lack of competitive products to put on the world market to earn income for the state and the society at large. Another problem that I list here on the slide is the political differences between two groups, what we'll call liberals and conservatives. Uh, although we're familiar with these terms in terms of American politics, the meanings are very different in Latin America. Liberals were essentially people who wanted to open up their society. They wanted to create free markets 
private enterprise, hmm. private property. And they wanted to limit the power of the Catholic Church, which controlled education, for example, and in many of these societies controlled large amounts of land. So they wanted to limit that authority of the church. They wanted to get it out of education because they felt that they needed more progressive forms of education. And they wanted to limit the economic power of the church. The conservatives, on the other hand, well, they agreed with the idea of pushing towards a free market economy with less control from the state, etc. They were concerned, the conservatives, with undermining the power of the church, largely for practical reasons. They understood that the church was a key guarantor of social stability. They were fearful that if the church's power is undermined, that the stability that the church provided would disappear and that they would face upheaval, uprising, rebellion from indigenous populations whom they still exploited. So the conservatives want to proceed with free markets, but they are very leery of attacks on the Catholic Church. Other than those differences, the fact is that liberals and conservatives came from the same social group, the upper strata in society, merchants, landowners. They often came from the same families, and their differences often had to do with familial disputes as much as they had to do with ideology. But the fact is, during the mid-19th century, the conflicts between liberals and conservatives were extreme and helped destabilize these political systems. At the same time, they did indeed face social unrest as indigenous populations took opportunities whenever the state was weakened to rebel against policies that exploited them because they were still being called upon uh, to work on public works, to build roads, etc., uh, for the benefit of the elite. Uh, their labor was still exploited on plantations where crops were being grown, and there would be periodic rebellions against both liberals and conservatives, but especially the liberals who are pressing ahead with this idea of free markets and greater exploitation of Indian labor. In Guatemala, specifically, that conflict between this aggressive liberal policy and the indigenous population exploded at the end of the 1830s when the local population, led by this man, Rafael Carrera, rebelled against the liberal government and installed Carrera in power, where he remained for more than a decade, all the way until 1865, really two decades, and he remained there in power until 1865, uh, during which time Carrera provided at least some degree of relief for the indigenous population by slowing the process of exploiting Indian labor, slowing the process of taking land from the Indian population because the way the liberals wanted to open up free markets was to take land from the indigenous subsistence population and put land, that land out on the market to sell to people who would use it for commercial agriculture. So the indigenous population had a strong opposition to that kind of policy that would deprive them of their land. And for a time, at least, Carrera provided the kind of government where those policies were not pursued aggressively. However, in the longer term, it would be the liberals who would come to dominate both Guatemala and other Central American states. Now. As all of this is taking place, as Central America is dealing with political instability, troubled economies, Americans are starting to develop an interest in Central America. Not because of any perceived wealth within these countries, but rather because of their location. Here in this next slide, uh, we see the reason why this happened. As you're familiar with American history, in 1849, we have the California Gold Rush. And thousands upon thousands of Americans are anxious to move from the eastern half of the country to California uh, to try to gain wealth in this gold rush that's taking place on the West Coast. However, at this time, there is no transcontinental railroad. There is no easy way to get from east to west. The only two 
ways to do it are, one, to cross the plains where you face Indian attacks and all kinds of physical deprivations, or to sail around the tip of South America, which is a long and dangerous trip. Various groups began looking for an alternative. And the easiest alternative appeared to be Central America, a relatively narrow stretch of land connecting Mexico to South America. Here was a place where possibly transit could be had across this area to save that enormous trip down across the southern tip of South America and also to avoid the dangerous passage across the central portions of the United States. On the slide here, you'll see one New York entrepreneur who took advantage of these opportunities, a man named William Aspenwald, set up a transit line across Panama. Essentially, his ships would take people and cargo down to Panama, then they would transport them uh, with wagons, etc., across the isthmus, and other ships would pick them up and take them to California. This became a highly profitable route for Aspenwald. A competitor in the person of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was one of the wealthiest men in America, arose when Vanderbilt exploited an opportunity in Nicaragua. He gets a concession from the Nicaraguan government to run a transit way across Nicaragua. His ships will take people and cargo to Nicaragua, and then with a combination of river and lake boats and stagecoaches, they'll be transported across Nicaragua and picked up by other ships to take them to California. So Vanderbilt is able to get this transit concession and compete with Aspenwall. And of course, the Nicaraguan elite is anxious to grant the concession because it means money for them. Times are difficult. Exports aren't very good. Here is a money-making proposition for the elite in the money that Vanderbilt will pay for his concession on an annual basis. However, this nifty little arrangement ran into problems in the mid-1850s. Because of the constant conflict between liberals and conservatives, liberals found themselves out of power and decided to reach out beyond their own borders to seek a solution. They hired an American mercenary. If we go back here to the screen, we'll see that man was William Walker. Walker came to Nicaragua with a band of U.S. mercenaries and proceeded to battle the conservative government and overthrow it. However, instead of putting the liberals in power, he put himself in power. And along the way, to reward certain supporters, he took away Vanderbilt's transit concession, which made Vanderbilt very unhappy. Eventually, Walker would be overthrown by a combined force of Central American armies with the support of Vanderbilt, who was anxious for revenge. And we'll come back and look at that story in more detail when we come back and look at Nicaragua. Uh, but for now, what it illustrates was the growing interest of the United States in the economic possibilities of Central America, mostly for transit purposes. But also, it illustrates something else, and that is that when Walker took power in Nicaragua, the U.S. government was deeply divided over the issue of slavery. As a result, because Walker clearly favored slave interests and, in fact, reestablished slavery in Nicaragua, where it had been abolished much earlier, because Walker was a supporter of southern slave interests in the United States, the U.S. government could not provide support to him because the country itself was deeply divided over the issue of slavery. So although we have a growing economic interest up until this time, up through the 1850s, the U.S. government is not in a position to extend its power into the region. However, as we get to the end of the 19th century, we'll see this change. On the one hand, American economic interests will grow rapidly, and the ability of the U.S. government to extend its power into the region and affect events there will increase dramatically. Now, in the latter decades of the 19th century, as we see here on the next slide, the liberals come to power 
in most Central American countries and remain in power for decades. In Guatemala, in the 1870s, that meant the rise to power of a man named Justo Rufino Barrios. Justo Rufino Barrios was a classic liberal who promoted economic growth, foreign investment. He would encourage the development of both coffee plantations, which were becoming a major export product for Central American countries, and also encourage foreign investment, which, as we will see, comes to play a major role in Guatemala's economy and in its society. In Nicaragua, another liberal comes to power in later decades, in the 1890s, a man named Jose Santos Zelaya. Zelaya follows similar policies, promoting the development of coffee plantations, because they provide a valuable cash crop, and encouraging foreign investment to further spur economic growth and development. This becomes the age of liberal elite regimes in Central America from the last quarter of the 19th century up through the early decades of the 20th century. Now, key to this foreign investment that liberals like Barrios and Zelaya wanted to attract was, of course, U.S. corporations. The United States was the most important industrial power uh, in close proximity to Central America. So it was logical that Central Americans would look to the U.S. when they were looking for technology and investment to try to accelerate their economic growth. And we look at this next slide, we'll see that that investment came particularly in the form of banana companies, corporations that would come in and plant vast fields of bananas for cultivation and ultimately export. Now, this investment began, however, in the form of transportation investment. As the Central American countries began growing and exporting coffee, they realized that one of their real disadvantages was the fact that most of the coffee was being grown in the Central and Pacific Coast areas of these countries. But their major markets were the eastern United States and Europe. The problem was, how do you get the coffee from the Pacific side of the country over to the Caribbean side so you can export it more easily to the U.S. and Europe? Their Caribbean coasts tend to be tropical climates covered with tropical rainforests. Climate is not very good for human health. There's not much of a population. They need railroads. So they seek to attract Americans who will invest in railroad development to connect the central and Pacific sides of their countries to the Caribbean coast so they can export their coffee. Now the person I list here on the slide, Minor C. Keith, was a man who was hired first in Costa Rica and later in other Central American countries to build railroads. And if we go back to that slide, we'll see that in developing his railroads, Keith did what American railroad builders did in general in the United States, and that was they received from the governments land grants as payment for building the roads. So as they build a railroad, they granted land along that right of way. And of course, to make the land profitable, the obvious answer was bananas grow naturally in the area. So if we start planting bananas in this land we're getting, then we can ship them out. That was the beginning of Keith's much larger enterprise, what became the United Fruit Company. At the end of the 19th century, in 1899, he incorporates this large enterprise known as United Fruit that by then is growing bananas throughout most of Central America, including Guatemala, all beginning with this railroad enterprise. And other American entrepreneurs like Sam the Banana Man, his name was Sam Zemore, but no, most people don't remember that, uh, also entered into this kind of business. In the end, really three major U.S. companies dominate the planting and export of bananas in Central America in the late 19th and early 20th century, but by far the biggest and most important of all was the United Fruit Company. Now, as American interests grow in Central America, the U.S. government is taking a much more intense look at and interest in Central America and the whole Caribbean region. 
The U.S. is concerned about extending its power into these areas, defending itself from possible European penetration of this region for strategic reasons, and also wanting to promote the growth of its own corporations. Indeed, U.S. policymakers saw American corporations as beacons of progress, that they would bring development, they would help bring rational economic growth to these countries. They would help modernize these societies. So it wasn't just a matter of, well, we're he here to help our own corporations for selfish reasons. They also see it as being on this civilizing mission, that these corporations are going to bring the accoutrements of civilized society, technologies, capital, wage labor, all of these things to these Central American countries. So the promotion of American corporations is seen as a positive benefit to the areas in which they operate. Now, to go back to the slide for a minute, the policy which the U.S. government developed by the turn of the century to help encourage this growth and development was known as dollar diplomacy. Basically, what dollar diplomacy was simply this. The U.S. government would encourage, if necessary, thrust upon Central American and Caribbean nations loans from U.S. banks so that U.S. financial institutions would control the finances of these countries. By establishing that kind of control, the U.S. was certain that, one, it could exclude Europeans from having any influence in the area, and two, the dominance of U.S. financial institutions would, of course, be a benefit to the U.S. corporations that were investing directly in these countries. So this becomes the policy of the U.S. And furthermore, the U.S. government, well, it relies on dollar diplomacy as its principal strategy. The U.S. government is not hesitant about using force, if necessary, to deal with recalcitrant countries in this region. In other words, they are willing to send battleships and marines into Caribbean and Central American countries if necessary in order to see that U.S. interests are protected and promoted. One of the places where they run into trouble early on is in Nicaragua, where the well-known liberal president, Jose Santos Zelaya, runs afoul of U.S. interests, in part because he was interested in uh, meddling in the affairs of other Central American governments. He was not the only Central American president that was doing this, but the U.S. found his actions particularly offensive. And, more importantly, Zelaya, who had granted a series of con economic concessions to American companies and American investors, reneged on those concessions, took them back from the Americans, beginning in 1905 and 1906, which really infuriated the U.S. government because, of course, this was a bad example. What if other Latin American countries, other Central American countries in particular, start doing the same thing, just taking back the economic concessions under which U.S. corporations work? One of the companies that Zelaya had offended was the United Fruit Company, hmm. somebody you really didn't want to have as an enemy. In light of this conflict, the U.S. government takes advantage of a rebellion against Zelaya in 1909. It intervenes and occupies the major port of Nicaragua and uses that as a base to provide support for the rebels, leading to the overthrow of Zelaya and to ongoing U.S. intervention in Nicaragua. And again, we're going to come back and look at that story in more detail when we're talking about Nicaragua specifically. But this was an example of the fact that the U.S. was not only using dollar diplomacy, it was also willing to use intervention, the landing of U.S. Marines, to get what it wanted in terms of Central American governments and how they treated U.S. business. Now, in Guatemala, they had less of a problem. In fact, one of the principal enemies of Zelaya uh, was the president-slash-dictator of Guatemala, a man named Manuel Estrada Cabrera, who also liked to meddle in Central American affairs, but was competing with Zelaya. He, on the other hand, unlike Zelaya, however, um, has managed to keep on the good side of the United States, at least 
through the early part of the 20th century. He had been more than happy to uh, make generous concessions to the United Fruit Company, uh, allowing them to expand their operations and become the most important enterprise in Guatemala. So he certainly uh, was seen as a positive force from the American perspective. However, uh, Cabrera, Estrada Cabrera would have some problem with the United States during World War I. During the First World War, the U.S. government was anxious to drive out all German investment in Latin America. This was partly, of course, the argument was, well, we're waging war against Germany. One of the things we're going to do is eliminate uh, German investment in the Western Hemisphere. And, of course, there was a practical side to this, too, that meant if you drive the Germans out, there are new opportunities for the Americans, as we will specifically see in this case. Uh, in Guatemala, there was one electric power company, and it was German-owned. And the U.S. government went to Estrada Cabrera and said, well, you know, you really need to get rid of the Germans. And he said, well, you know, they are the only electric company in town. And besides which, there were thousands of other Germans living here growing coffee. And they really wouldn't want to disrupt the economy by getting rid of all of these people and seizing their property. Uh, the U.S. government came back and said, well, that's a nice sentiment, but let me tell you this. You see, Germany is being blockaded by the British, okay? so they can't send anything to Guatemala right now. And if the electric company is going to keep functioning, it needs spare parts. Only we can supply those spare parts to you. And if you don't take over the German company, we won't supply the spare parts, and the country will go dark. So Estrada Cabrera decided, well, <laughs> that's a good idea then. Uh, I'll seize the German electric company. And the U.S. government specifically went to the General Electric Company and said, you know, it would be a great idea if you extended your investments overseas and took over the German electric company in Guatemala. To do that, if we go back to the slide, uh, they sent a representative, a man named Henry Catlin, down uh, to arrange for the transfer of the German company to GE. Now, while Catlin is there, he gets involved with Estrada Cabrera and another American uh, who has been put in charge of all f alien property in Guatemala. In addition to the GE deal, Catlin makes a deal with Estrada Cabrera and this other American where the three of them are going to take control of all of the German coffee plantations and divide them up between the three of them. And they'll sell them to themselves at rock bottom prices. So they're going to make a fortune by seizing the property in the name of the Guatemalan government and then have the Guatemalan government sell the property to them at low, low prices. This didn't make a lot of people in Guatemala happy, certainly not the German residents who had lost their coffee plantations, uh, but also a lot of Guatemalans who looked at this and said, look, that's a total ripoff. Uh, by this time, we're talking 1919, uh, Estrada Cabrera was in a lot of trouble. His opposition, political opposition in Guatemala had taken up arms against him and were marching on the capital. Uh, it was at that point that Henry Catlin made a suggestion uh, to Estrada Cabrera. He said, look at you know, once the rebels get in the capital, what you should do is turn your artillery on your own city and bombard it. And that way you can kill the rebels. Of course, you'll kill a lot of civilians, too, because they'll be in the capital as well. But Henry thought this was a grand idea. Estrada uh, Cabrera, Cabrera decided not to do that. Uh, he was overthrown. And then the problem came up that Henry Catlin was still there. And the political opposition, now in control of the government, declared him persona non grata. In fact, to get him out of the country safely, a contingent of Marines had to march into the capital and safely escort him out to Puerto Barrios, where they put him on a steamer back to the United States. Uh, here we see that very rapidly, economic interests and U.S. political interests and the interventions of the U.S. government have intensified rapidly by the early part of the 20th century, and the United States is having a major say in the policies of governments, particularly the government of Guatemala at this time, how it deals with U.S. business and how it deals with other foreign powers such as Germany is being dictated in no small measure by the U.S. government. And there is of course, the considerable and powerful influence of U.S. corporate interests as well. Now, at the end of the 1920s, the 
long era of rule by elite liberal parties, rule by people like Estrada Cabrera, etc., is going to come to an end because of the economic devastation visited on Central America by the Great Depression. By the late 1920s, the prices for primary products like coffee and bananas, which are the two major exports of virtually every Central American country, are falling rapidly. And of course, during the 1930s, they basically collapse. And the problem for Central America in particular is that there is no prospect for early recovery of these prices for a simple reason. These are not basic foodstuffs. Believe it or not, you can actually live without coffee. Yeah, I you know many people would deny that, but it's actually possible to get through day to day without six cups of coffee in your system. Uh, and you can live without bananas. I suppose a lot of people in this country can take or leave bananas, but the fact is neither of them, you know, it's not like bread, and you know, it's not like milk, etc. sort of basic foodstuffs that are essential uh, to your diet, and therefore there is inevitably a level of demand that simply isn't going to diminish unless lots of people are simply dead. These were essentially marginal products. People didn't have to have them. They were discretionary buys. And when the Depression hits the United States, the prices collapse, and there's very little prospect of quick turnaround. So the devastation in Latin America and Central America is widespread. The banana companies are paying starvation wages if they're working at all. And coffee plantations are very much in the same situation. In El Salvador, a peasant uprising is triggered by these desperate conditions. That leads to a military coup. A military officer replaces the existing civilian government and to what was known as the Matanza, the massacre, where 10,000 peasants were slaughtered as a result of this rebellion. When I say slaughtered, they just went out and shot people, you know, large numbers. Most of these people were not bearing arms. They were not protesting. The military simply marched into villages, lined people up, and shot everybody in the village on the grounds that we should kill enough of you, we'll get the rebels, right? Sooner or later. So there is massive repression in situations such as this. In Nicaragua, a rebellion is led by Augusto Sandino. Sandino leads a rebellion of a similar nature by peasants and workers, uh, and it has a very specific anti-American theme. He says he won't put down his arms until the U.S. withdraws completely from Nicaragua, where it has been almost constantly since 1909. It has, at one point, 6,000 U.S. Marines fighting Sandino. And the situation is only resolved in the early 1930s when the National Guard, trained by the U.S. and led by this man, Anastasio Somoza, assassinates Sandino bringing an end to his rebellion. And again, this is something we'll look at in more detail later on when we get back to Nicaragua itself. But we see here in these cases clear signs of social rebellion, political upheaval, people who have long felt the disparity of wealth and power in their society and now are driven to the edge by the desperation of the Great Depression, rebelling against their own elites, often with a strong anti-American theme because many of these people saw the Americans as the close allies of their own elites and that this alliance is what caused their poverty and their exploitation. So many of these rebellions have both anti-elite themes and anti-American themes. What they usually lead to, as in the case of El Salvador and Nicaragua, is military dictatorship sweeping aside the old elite, liberal elite governments and putting in military dictators who will crush any signs of rebellion. In Guatemala, such a dictator emerged in the person of Jorge Ubico. Ubico was the military dictator who maintained order in Guatemala. And the simple theme that he and other dictators in Central America followed during these years, the 1930s and early 1940s in particular, was simply, look at 
you'll either work and accept the situation as it is, or we'll shoot you. Okay? One or the other. Let's either don't protest and continue to work, no matter how low your wages are, or we'll kill you. This kind of repression was characteristic not only of Guatemala, but Central America in general at this time, as the established powers struggled by whatever means possible to survive and maintain stability in the midst of this catastrophe that was the Great Depression. By the 1940s, however, many of these regimes are being challenged. Part of the challenge comes from the growth in labor movements in Central America, that workers in plantations, workers on railroad systems have begun organizing and demanding rights, demanding higher wages, shorter hours, etc. Along with this is a movement towards democracy, in part inspired by these labor movements, in part inspired by an expanding middle class, a group that largely didn't exist in Central America at the beginning of the 20th century or existed in only small numbers. Uh, professional people, white collar workers, uh, government employees, these were the kinds of people that now constituted the middle class and were pressing for a more open political system. And these pressures begin to appear throughout Central America at this time, but most notably in Guatemala. In Guatemala in 1944, the Ubico regime is toppled by a combined effort of young military officers, mostly middle class in origin, and civilian political leaders, along with the support of students and labor unions. These groups come together to help topple the Ubico dictatorship and to begin a democratic experiment which was certainly unique in Guatemala's history. Up until this time, there really had never been anything approximating a democratic election in Guatemala. Elections were strictly for the use of the elite. The small group of landowners and merchants that dominated society, they were the ones that got to vote. They were the ones that got to pick who was going to be president. It was very much like the old days of the liberal conservative conflicts. The party names may have changed, but it's still basically elements of the elite. This, for the first time, opened the possibility of national elections which would incorporate a much broader spectrum of society. And indeed, in 1945, this man who's listed on the slide here, Juan Arevalo, is elected as president of Guatemala, truly its first democratically elected president. However, it's important to qualify this when we talk about this democratic process. It certainly was democratic. And every effort was meant to incorporate as many people as possible in the voting process. But most of this consisted of people in the urban areas. And it still meant a minority of Guatemala's population. Because most of Guatemala's population consisted of Indians living in the countryside, Native Americans, uh, often of Mayan descent, who spoke more than 100 different dialects among them, and had, for centuries, of course, been exploited for their labor, and virtually totally excluded from participation in their own societies. It is going to take a considerable and lengthy process to fully incorporate these people into their own society and make them active participants in the political process. This is true in 1945, and it was still largely true in 1954. Not that the government was not trying, and particularly after 1950, to reach out to these people and draw them in. But after centuries of exclusion and oppression, it was going to take a considerable amount of time to overcome the variety of divisions that separated them, linguistic issues being part of it, because many of them don't even speak Spanish as a second language. So this is democracy, but it's still a democracy that's confined mostly, and not exclusively, to urban areas, to the settled populations in towns and cities. One thing that does come out of the new democratic government under Arevalo is a new labor code. In other words, putting into law a set of rights for workers that 
yes, they can form unions. The unions can go on strike. Uh, they are entitled to an eight-hour day, et cetera. At least in theory, the law allows for that to happen. Now, whether it's going to happen, whether people are actually going to be given those rights is another matter. You can have a law, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be enforced with any great regularity. And certainly early on, the law was not enforced with great intensity, at least not at this time. Now, as Arevalo's term is coming to an end in 1949, there is competition to succeed him among several different figures, including several military officers who had played a role in the 1944 revolution. One of them was a man named Francisco Arana. Arana, however, was assassinated in July of 1949. His assassination was met with great suspicion by American observers in Guatemala who believed that one of the other candidates, Jacobo Arbenz, and we'll get to him in a moment, uh, was really responsible for this, that this was the work of leftists who were trying to undermine the democratic system. In fact, uh, the best evidence now would suggest that Arevalo arranged the assassination because he was certain that Arana was preparing to stage a military coup and seize the government so he decided to preempt that by assassinating Arana. But the U.S. observers believe that this is the work of leftists, and particularly of this man, Jacobo Arbenz, who was the leading candidate for the presidency at this time, and another one of these young military officers who had participated in the 1944 uprising. Arbenz is elected president and takes office, and immediately the question comes up about communist influence in his government. A variety of interpretations have been applied to the situation in Guatemala, not just by Americans who were there at the time, but in the half century since these events by a variety of academics with different analyses. Now, first of all, the reality is, yes, there were communists in Guatemala. In fact, this man, Jose Fortini, uh, was the head of the PGT, uh, which translates as the Guatemalan Workers' Party, translates as the Guatemalan Communist Party. Okay, that's what the PGT was. It was the Guatemalan Communist Party. Now, it has been argued that the communists, in fact, had very low representation in the Guatemalan legislature, which is true. They had relatively few members. There was really no way that they could influence uh, or determine votes in the legislature because they did not have a uh, large representation there. However, the other argument is that, well, yes, they may have been few in numbers in terms of elected representatives, but on the other hand, they had close ties to Artibans himself, which is true. He looked to many of these people, particularly Fortuny, uh, for advice on the changes that he wanted to make in Guatemala. And their influence was apparent, particularly in the agrarian reform law, the Decre Decree 900, as I listed here on this slide, uh, issued in May of 1952, was clearly crafted in part by the PGT and its leaders, uh, a plan that would divide up the land. If we go to the slide, we'll see that uh, Decree 900 uh, when it was put in place in 1952 and then actually implemented over the next two years, granted land, gave land to 100,000 families, which is a massive transfer of land primarily to indigenous inhabitants who had been deprived of their land over the past several centuries. So this did have a significant impact, although even this number was still a minority of the people who were entitled to land under the decree's provisions. But they did begin in a major way. So the other argument, contrary to the argument that says, well, there weren't very many communists in the legislature, is, well, yeah, but they're influential because they were able to uh, advise Arbenz on things like the agrarian reform law, which is true. Now, the third argument is this. Yeah, they're communists, but they have nothing to do with the Soviet Union that the Guatemalan Communist Party was entirely homegrown. 
Uh, they had no connection with the Soviet Union or with the Communist International, which happens to be true. So then the question is, okay, are they a threat to American interests? But those are three perspectives, okay? One is, well, they're, they, there weren't many of them in the legislature anyways. Two, yeah, there weren't many, but they were influential. And three is, yeah, they may have been influential, but were they really a threat to the United States if they weren't closely associated or associated at all with the Soviet Union? We'll come back to these issues in a moment. Meanwhile, once again, Americans are taking a very serious interest in Guatemala. Now, on the one hand, the 1944 revolution was one of a series of movements in Latin America where uh, authoritarian governments were either removed or liberalized. And the U.S. had supported these kinds of movements initially uh, because, as it said, well, we fought the war uh, in Europe as a war against tyranny and in favor of democracy, so we want to see democracy flourish. However, the United States quickly became suspicious of the elected government in Guatemala, never mind Arbenz in the 1950s. In the mid-1940s with Arevalo, they considered him to be a suspicious figure. Part of the concerns stemmed from the people who were working in Guatemala representing U.S. government interests. For example, uh, Truman's newly appointed ambassador to Guatemala, a man named Richard Patterson. Richard Patterson had been a corporate executive with RKO, the media corporation, and DuPont, DuPont Chemical, before he accepted his ambassadorship. So needless to say, he's very much in favor of American business and American business interests. And in fact, when he becomes ambassador in 1948, uh, one of the things he will do is arrange a series of meetings with leading U.S. corporations in Guatemala. And if we go back to the slide, you'll see three in particular that I give the acronym for. The first one, the IRCA, stands for the International Railways of Central America. The IRCA is, in fact, a subsidiary of United Fruit. They denied it, but in fact, we know positively. They controlled the majority of the stock. They, most of the people on the board of executives of the IRCA were from the United Fruit Company, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a subsidiary. It's the subsidiary that controls the railroads. And particularly, its main holding is the railroad in Guatemala. And then there's UFCO, which is the United Fruit Company itself. And finally, EB&S, which is an abbreviation for electric bond and share. And all electric bond and share is, is a subsidiary of General Electric. So with these three corporations, the International Railways of Central America controls the railroads. The United Fruit Company controls the banana industry, which is the largest industry and the most important enterprise in Guatemala. And electric bond and share is really a GE subsidiary that controls all the electric power generation in Guatemala. So these three have a lot of influence over the economy of Guatemala. They control the railroads, they control the power, they control the banana industry. And Patterson made clear that he was highly sympathetic to their interests and very concerned about things such as the labor code that was passed that was seen as a threat to these corporations because they never had to worry about dealing with unions. They never had to worry about laws requiring an eight-hour day, et cetera, et cetera. That had never been permitted under Jorge Ubico or his predecessors. Now there was this threat that unions were going to have a say. Further influencing what was perceived to be going on in Central America, and specifically Guatemala at this time, were reports by FBI agents in Guatemala. Now, the FBI fulfills the role that eventually the CIA takes in Latin America at this time. In other words, the FBI sends agents down there to keep an eye on political developments to report intelligence information. And dispatches by FBI agents in Guatemala painted a grim picture of what was going on. Specifically, the labor reform and then later the land reform bills were both seen as clearly communist-inspired, that they were seeking to create a communist regime. Now, the question is, 
is that at all accurate? You know, were these laws, in fact, uh, symptoms of a communist network? Well, again, we need to look more closely at what happens in Guatemala at this time. The biggest threats that these laws represented were to the United Fruit Company and the International Railways of Central America, which again is like saying the United Fruit Company twice. For the railway company, the threat had to do with a specific government policy, and that was that the Arbenz government had committed itself to building a highway that would connect the capital to its major port, Puerto Barrios, named after the liberal president of the 19th century. Up until this time, the only effective means of moving goods in particular, but also people, between the port and the capital was on the IRCA railway. Other than that, you'd have to take a mule, horse, you know, there were no paved roads, developed roads, that you could move vehicles over efficiently. So the government decides that, well, the railway's got a, a monopoly. We can make things more efficient by building a highway and running trucks and buses between the capital and the port. And that way, the railway will have to lower its rates and be more competitive, because then there'll be an alternative to just taking the railway. Uh, this was seen as a direct threat and as a communist conspiracy by the IRCA. Secondly, unions did go on strike against the United Fruit Company, and now under Arbenz, the government supported the unions uh, on the grounds that they were within their rights under the labor reform law that had been passed under Arevalo. Finally, and most significantly, the Land Reform Decree, Decree 900, if fully implemented, was going to take 400,000 out of the 555,000 acres of land that the United Fruit Company held in Guatemala. So it stood to lose almost 80% of its land holdings in Guatemala. Now, most of this is not being worked. Now, most of the land is not growing bananas. Uh, the reason the company had this much land, it was only using a fraction of this land. You know, about 80% of it was not being used. Uh, one reason was to have land because disease could affect the bananas and they'd have to move and develop new land. But the most important reason was to prevent other people from growing bananas. If you control all the banana growing land, then nobody can compete with you, right? It's a good way to maintain a monopoly. You have all the land, so nobody else can grow bananas. Uh, that was the major reason why they got control of all this land. Uh, but these policies by the government, building the highway, supporting the unions, and the land reform law, which threatened to take away most of United Fruits land, caused a virtual war between the U.S. corporations and the Arbenz regime. Now, the United Fruit Company, being a modern corporation, decides that one of the things it needs to do is to win the public relations war between itself and the Guatemalan government. And to do that, it hires a man named Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays uh, is considered one of the pioneers of marketing and advertising in the United States. He had uh, earned his national reputation during the 1930s and 40s with all kinds of campaigns uh, selling consumer products like uh, uh, nylon stockings, etc. Uh, so he was considered a genius at public relations. And Bernays uh, was going to launch a media campaign, uh, getting stories put in various newspapers, inviting reporters down to Guatemala where they were conducted on special tours by the United Fruit Company, etc. Uh, and essentially portraying uh, the Arbenz regime is a communist regime uh, that was trying to destroy the United Fruit Company. This was designed to create uh, public sympathy for the corporation in the United States. But in addition, uh, the United Fruit Company had other connections. Bernays was okay for 
you know, getting the public to be sympathetic uh, to the United Fruit Company and hostile towards Guatemala. But to really get something done, uh, you had to have contact with people who really held the levers of power in Washington. And this United Fruit had, particularly in the persons of Allen and John Foster Dulles. Of course, Alan Dulles is the Director of Central Intelligence at this time, and his brother, John Foster, is the Secretary of State under the Eisenhower administration. Now, both of these men worked at one time for a well-known law firm in New York, uh, Sullivan and Cromwell. In fact, Sullivan and Cromwell had been involved in everything from uh, the seizure of Panama for the building of the Panama Canal uh, to United Fruit Interests, and was one of the law firms representing Microsoft during the antitrust lawsuit <laughs> filed by the U.S. government. Uh, so they've been around a long time, and they have a lot of influence. So the Dulles Brothers' connection to United Fruit was through their work for Sullivan and Cromwell, representing United Fruit. And their connections went back at least to the 1930s. Back in the 1930s, uh, conditions in Guatemala weren't that different than they, had, than they were in the 1950s. Uh, the IRCA already had its railroad monopoly, you know, taking all the goods from Puerto Barrios to the capital and back again. In addition, the movement of bananas out of Guatemala and the shipment of much of what Guatemala needed in terms of imports was handled by the United Fruit Company through its fleet of ships known as the Great White Fleet, because they're all painted white. Now, one competitor that the Great White Fleet did have was the Cosmos Line, a German freighter company that handled not only freight into Guatemala, but handled all kinds of shipping between Central America and Europe. These relationships might have remained relatively unimportant uh, for the United States, except that when the Depression hit, the Roosevelt administration launches a new approach to Latin America, the good neighbor policy, that we're going to stop those interventions. Remember, we were sending all those warships down there and Marines and so forth. Oh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to try not to intervene and work with you. And in working with you, one of the things we want to do is try to resuscitate international trade. Remember we talked about when Roosevelt came to power, had the backing of high-tech co international corporations that wanted to see the international economy resuscitated. Well, Roosevelt administration goes about trying to do that specifically through a policy of signing trade agreements with various countries, particularly in Latin America, that will reduce tariffs and encourage trade between that country and the United States. And Guatemala was one of those places where such a treaty was signed to encourage trade. 1937, more than a year after the treaty had been signed, uh, the U.S. ambassador there, a man named Faye Allen Desportes, uh, was getting complaints being sent to him by the State Department. Complaints from U.S. corporations that they felt that they were getting the shaft, basically, uh, in sending their goods into Guatemala. Because although there was this new trade agreement reducing tariffs, and although the American company said, look, it, because we're so close to Guatemala and because of the, the trade treaty, when we get our goods to Puerto Barrios, the main port, they are indeed cheaper than anybody else's, including German goods. And Germany is our main competitor in Guatemala. So when the goods get there to the port, they're cheaper than the German goods. But by God, when they get to the capital, they're the same price. What could be going wrong? Well, the ambassador of Desportes looks into it and discovers that the reason why U.S. goods that are lower in price than the German goods when they get there and the same price when they get to the capital 
Well, the reason that's happening is because the International Railways of Central America, i.e. United Fruit, is charging higher rates for freight on the American goods than on the German goods. So the State Department, learning of this, after the ambassador's report, calls in the United Fruit Company and wants an answer. You know, what are you doing? You know, you're hurting American corporations by this. And coming to the State Department to represent United Fruit was the young attorney, Alan Dulles, working for Sullivan and Cromwell. And Dulles said, look, at, we can explain this. You see, we're in competition with the Cosmos line for freight shipments across the Atlantic. Now, if in fact German goods are going to arrive at Puerto Barrios, costing more than American goods because of the cost of shipping them across the Atlantic, that means the Germans, the Cosmos line, is going to try to correct that by cutting their rates for shipping goods across the Atlantic. We're going to have to respond by cutting our rates. And pretty soon, we'll be in a ruinous competition. So it'll wreck our business. You don't want to see that happen, right? So that's why we charge the higher rates on American goods. So their goods will cost the same as the German. We won't get into this ruinous competition with the Cosmos line. <laughs> well, the State Department in the end didn't think that was such a hot idea. Uh, they said, well, you know, really, you know, serving your own interests by shafting American manufacturers is really not what American policy is all about. Um, in the end, the United Fruit Company agreed to lower a few of these rates, but in fact, they lowered it on goods that were hardly ever imported into Guatemala anyway, so it hardly made a difference. But more than that, they were really upset with the U.S. ambassador because he had done something bad. He had challenged their interests. Uh, so they went to Jorge Ubico, who was, of course, the dictator at the time, and said, you know, you shouldn't talk to the ambassador anymore. He's a bad person. And in fact, that's what the ambassador found out the next time he went to the presidential palace, he was told, no, Jorge's not speaking to you anymore. Uh, in other words, for the president of Guatemala, it was more important to be on the good side of the United Fruit Company than it was to be on the good side of the U.S. ambassador, uh, who later, by the way, got shipped off to Colombia <laughs> after causing problems in Guatemala. So the power of the United Fruit Company and their representatives, particularly Alan Dulles, uh, to alter conditions and influence conditions in Guatemala comes out in this story all the way back at the end of the 1930s. Now, people are prone to say, well, but, you know, would they really, you know, risk their position uh, as director of central intelligence and as secretary of state just to protect these corporate interests? Well they may not have seen it exactly in those terms. And besides which, they weren't the only ones who were involved uh, with the United Fruit Company and influential in the U.S. government. John Cabot, who's listed here on the slide. John Cabot was the Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. In other words, top dog in the State Department on Latin American relations. Uh, he was a former director of the United Fruit Company. And there are a series of people in the administration who had previously worked for the United Fruit Company. Uh, John McCormick, who was the Speaker of the House at this time, uh, was from Massachusetts and had often defended the interests of the United Fruit Company in Congress. So they have some very influential friends in Congress and in the Eisenhower administration. How did they actually see this? I think it's reasonable to say that they could look at it as both a threat to the United Fruit Company and a threat, a threat to American interests, as a communist threat to American interests. I mean, the United States, ever since the beginning of the 20th century at least, had said that American corporations were an important part of U.S. policy towards Central America, towards the development of uh, progressive societies, reform, economic development. All of this could be accomplished through the promotion of U.S. corporations and their interests. So it's not surprising that American government leaders, including in the 1950s, would see a threat to U.S. corporations as a threat to America's larger interests in Central America. If these are the instruments of our foreign policy, or important parts of the, the instruments of our foreign policy, that these companies go there and carry out their activities, uh, 
Well, then a challenge to them is a challenge to U.S. interests. And of course, if there are indeed communists in the Guatemalan regime, it's not too great a leap to say, hey, look at, you know, this is a communist conspiracy against American interests. Yes, you know, we can look back now and say, well, but these guys weren't even connected to the Soviet Union. Uh, American policymakers really weren't listening to that kind of argument at the time. Their point was they are taking actions hostile to U.S. corporate interests. U.S. corporate interests are important instruments of U.S. foreign policy, and who but communists would want to attack and threaten U.S. interests. So here we have a convergence of U.S. corporate interests, the United Fruit Company in particular, the International Railways of Central America, to a lesser extent, GE. They also felt a pinch, but it was particularly United Fruit that feels threatened here. And the interests of the U.S. government in wanting to extend its power and influence in this region and doing that to a considerable extent for more than half a century through U.S. corporations, the convergence of these two interests means a challenge to the U.S. corporation, means a challenge to U.S. interests that can readily be interpreted in the minds of these people at in the 1950s as a direct communist threat to the United States, a threat to our interests. So it's really that convergence of factors. If we're going to talk about, okay, what motivated the U.S. here? It's both the individual economic interests of a particular corporation, the United Fruit Company, but also in Washington, a company that has considerable influence, and the thought processes of U.S. policymakers at this time who have long seen these corporations as a means of projecting U.S. power and who at the same time are prone to see any challenge to U.S. interests at this time as communist-inspired. All of these factors come to bear in Guatemala at this time and create an increasingly hostile environment between first U.S. corporate interests and the Arbenz government, but then the U.S. government itself will become increasingly involved in this situation in an attempt to alter the course of events in Guatemala by defending a U.S. corporation, specifically the United Fruit Company. What's the underlying historical problem? The disparities of wealth and social power that had existed in Central America, and particularly in Guatemala, down through the centuries that had been reinforced in recent decades by the dictatorship of Jorge Ubico, and now had been challenged by a coalition of labor unions, middle class groups, and students in the revolution of 1944, and through at least one and now a second presidential administration reflecting some of those interests, the kinds of policies that Arbenz was pursuing of uh, land reform, labor decrees, building the highway, were all plans to encourage a greater distribution of wealth within his society and address the issue of dependence on a single large American corporation in the form of United Fruit and dependence on a few basic products, particularly the export of bananas and coffee. So all of this was part of this challenge to the old order by social groups that had gained a voice for the first time in the 1940s in Guatemala. The danger for this regime is that despite that support, that support still only represents a minority within this population. It still has important enemies among the elite, the landowners, the church, and its most important constituency, and one that it's reaching out to, uh, the indigenous population, reaching out to particularly with land reform, but also with programs for education, etc. That constituency is still not a highly active, fully participating element in Guatemalan politics or Guatemalan society. So this is a regime that is based upon still narrow political participation. We already saw in Iran the danger that holds when the United States decides to act against such a regime. How all of that actually takes place, we'll come back and look at in just a few minutes.